Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today, the BSP publishes the 74th edition of the Quarterly Inflation Report. This is part of the BSP's efforts to convey to the public the overall thinking and analysis behind the BSP's decisions on monetary policy during the first quarter of 2020. The Philippines saw a difficult start to 2020 with the eruption of the Taal volcano in January and the beginning of the novel coronavirus outbreak in February. By mid-March, the COVID-19 crisis had turned into a full-scale pandemic prompting governments and central banks around the world to deploy measures to limit the spread of the virus and mitigate its adverse impact on households and businesses. On the part of the BSP, we recognize right away that both the Taal eruption and the COVID-19 pandemic would pose significant disruptions to domestic economic activity in the coming months. In response, we undertook an assertive policy response by easing our monetary policy settings to cushion the country's growth momentum and uplift market confidence. In February, the BSP reduced the policy interest rate by 25 basis points. We followed this with a reduction by another 50 basis points in March. As the health crisis deepened, we also decided to deploy extraordinary liquidity measures and provide regulatory relief for financial institutions to complement the national government's broader fiscal and health initiatives to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on Filipino households and businesses. All this was possible largely because of the ample policy room afforded by the manageable inflation environment together with well-anchored inflation expectations. In line with our earlier projections, inflation at an average of 2.7% in Q1 2020 was well within the national government's target range of 2%, 2 to 4% for the year. Headline inflation had risen slightly during the quarter owing to higher price increases of selected food and non-food items. Prices of fish, fruits, and vegetables went up due partly to commercial fishing ban imposed on certain provinces and on weather-related supply disruptions. Transport inflation likewise picked up in the first quarter in view of upward adjustments in domestic petroleum products. At the same time, the risk to the inflation outlook have decidedly shifted toward the downside by March of this year, mainly owing to the potential of the pandemic to dampen aggregate demand. While we believe that the timely adoption of quarantine measures will help in slowing the spread of the virus in the country, the resulting disruptions to domestic industries and private spending will definitely slow down economic growth in the near term. The spread of the COVID-19 outbreak to many countries has also caused the global economy to go into recession. In turn, tourism, trade, foreign investments, and remittances from overseas Filipinos are expected to contract. Indeed, there is now considerable uncertainty surrounding the near-term outlook of the Philippine economy. The real economy had just come off another solid year in 2019. Full-year growth settled within the medium-term average of 6%. However, suddenly the outlook for domestic economic activity has deemed considerably in recent weeks. Meanwhile, uncertainty over the impact of the health crisis 
has also dampened market sentiment based on the BSP survey of business and consumer expectations. Volatility in the domestic financial market also increased, with the Philippine stock market index taking a deep decline in Q1 2020 as investors became more risk averse. Auction results in the primary market during the early part of the quarter likewise reflected investors' risk aversion. By the end of the quarter, the yields for government securities in the secondary market generally have increased relative to end December 2019 levels as market players opted to hold on to liquidity in anticipation of substantial funding requirements in view of the enhanced community quarantine. The country's debt spreads also widened along with its international peers as the global financial system faced negative shocks from the impact of the global pandemic. Nevertheless, the country's firm macroeconomic fundamentals supported the financial system. The peso even appreciated from the previous quarter as investors welcomed the country's credit rating outlook upgrade by Fitch ratings in February. Further, based on the BSP's latest senior loan officer survey, bank lending standards have been broadly unchanged, indicating their continued prudence in managing risk. Banks' asset quality and capital adequacy indicators pointed to the soundness of the country's financial system. Yet, the BSP remains vigilant over how credit activity and domestic liquidity dynamics will evolve in the coming months. These developments form the backdrop for the BSP's policy actions during the first quarter of the year. Strong headwinds owing largely to the COVID-19 pandemic required swift and decisive monetary action. The cumulative reduction of 75 basis points in the policy rate during the quarter, which we followed up with another cut of 50 basis points just last week, was necessary to support domestic economic activity and boost market sentiment. Furthermore, to help ensure sufficient domestic liquidity in the financial system and lower borrowing costs for affected firms and households, the BSP reduced the reserve requirement ratios for universal and commercial banks and non-bank financial institutions with quasi-banking functions, which took effect on 3 April. The BSP also temporarily reduced the term deposit facility auctions volumes to zero for particular tenors. These measures complement the various regulatory relief measures that BSP put in place to facilitate the flow of credit and ensure the delivery of financial services amid the quarantine period. To help shore up market confidence and support the NG's broader initiatives to fight COVID-19, the BSP also implemented extraordinary liquidity measures. This include, first, the $300 billion repurchase agreement with the Bureau of Treasury, and second, the BSP's purchases of government securities from banks in the secondary market. In closing, the BSP has implemented measures to safeguard the stability of the macroeconomy and provide support for the national government's broader effort to alleviate the spillover effects of the pandemic. We wish to reassure the Filipino people of the BSP's commitment and readiness to deploy its full range of instruments in responding 
to the needs of the Filipino households and businesses amid these difficult times. Ladies and gentlemen, the full text of the inflation report, as well as the latest results of the BSP's quarterly survey of senior bank loan officers, shall be made available via the BSP's website. In the meantime, we now open the floor for your questions. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for participating in this uh, press briefing. Uh, we received uh, eight questions from media, and we have grouped them together. Um, uh, first uh, question is on inflation outlook. Uh, we received uh, five questions on that. And then we received also uh, a question pertaining to liquidity and credit condition. And lastly, uh, two questions on monetary policy going forward. So for the first question regarding uh, inflation outlook, the question is after an off-cycle rate cut, what is the latest BSP forecast for 2020 and 2021? What is your short-term to medium-term view on inflation? Um, our inflation projection, uh, we see that um, inflation would average 2.2% for 2020 and 2.4% for 2021. We are closely monitoring the developments in both domestic and global front. And so far, there are indications that trees to the inflation outlook have shifted to the downside. There are uh, some key consideration uh, to this uh, inflation outlook. First is the trend in the global crude oil prices. Declining global oil prices uh, has been observed due to lower global demand. To buy, uh, particularly to buy crude oil prices continued to slide despite the announced 9.7 million barrel per day production cut. Uh, agreed upon between the OPEC members, Russia and Mexico, due to lower global demands and concerns over storage for excess supply. The global crude oil prices um, were assumed to average $31.56 per barrel in 2020 and $29.22 for, per barrel for, uh, for 2021. And comparing this with our earlier assumption, uh, these uh, prices are now uh, $10.8 per barrel lower for 2020 and uh, $14.93 per barrel in 2021. Second, uh, our key consideration while we say that uh, inflation outlook uh, have shifted to the downside is the uh, view about the global growth. Uh, global economic prospects have weakened further due to the impact of the spread of COVID-19. As a matter of fact, in the um, uh, World Economic Outlook released by the IMF this April, the global forecast is uh, expected to contract by 3% in 2020, uh, which is significantly lower than the contraction of 0.1% in two, uh, 2009 during the aftermath of the global financial crisis. The, ba the baseline global growth scenario assumes that the pandemic will fade by uh, second half of 2020 and that economic activity will start to normalize after containment efforts are lifted and with sufficient policy support. For 2021, the IMF projects global growth to recover by 5.8%. Uh, Despite the downward revision to growth in 2020, the IMF views that the balance of risk to the outlook remain on the downside, with the possibility of a more protracted pandemic, possible recurrence of milder outbreaks in 2021, and longer containment efforts. The third consideration for an uh, inflation outlook, uh, which we see that uh, risk is on the downside, is the trend of global non-oil prices. Again, the IMF projects that non-oil prices will decline by 1.1% in 2020 and 0.6% in 2021. Um, major uh, commodities like uh, minerals uh, and, and food uh, prices are seen to be lower as compared to their earlier estimates. And lastly, the trend of the U.S. federal funds rate. The latest futures spot indicate that the Fed, Fed funds rate 
could remain in zero lower bound up to 2022. So uh, we eliminate that uh, pressure uh, on this part of the uh, uh, fund uh, U.S. as a comparator to the Philippines. I, I think that summarizes our response to question number one. Uh, may I pass the uh, question number two for uh, Director Deng's uh, response? Thank you, A.G. The second question that we received is about the inflation outlook. So the question is, when do you see inflation bottoming out? Are you ruling out inflation being problematic this year, and why or why not? So first of all, as the assistant governor said, inflation is uh, projected to be quite benign this year, uh, this year and also next year. And the latest um, uh, inflation path or forecast path that we that we have at the moment uh, suggests that we could we could see inflation decelerating below the two to four uh, percent range target uh, in the third quarter of this year and also in the fourth quarter, uh, first quarter of 2021. Then after which, by the second quarter of next year we see inflation gradually picking up towards the target. Um, the, of course, this uh, outlook um, has a lot of uh, uncertainty embedded in it because there are a lot of uh, different factors that are uh, at play. Um, but the assessment is that the overall uh, risks seem to be weighted towards the downside uh, for the inflation forecast. And so the key factors that could push down inflation for this year and also for next year have to do with a, a, a deeper slowdown in global economic activity and also uh, a, a much more uh, a weaker uh, prospect for domestic economic activity. Um, and this could lead to, to weaker global activity could lead to a sharper decline, for example, in, in tourism uh, receipts as well as trade and remittances. And that could be a downward influence on, on uh, GDP growth. And uh, also uh, the, the possibility of a, a, a longer imposition of uh, containment measures like the enhanced community quarantine could um, uh, exact, uh, exert a downward pressure on economic activity as well. So we're, we're not completely ruling out uh, any uh, problems or spikes in inflation this year. So some of the upside risks that we're uh, seeing are, are mostly linked to food prices. So these, uh, these uh, have to do with uh, things like increased or higher uh, import prices for rice because of the um, weather disruption in the region, because of dry conditions in major rice producing uh, countries in, the, in ASEAN where we import from. Um, some impact also the African swine fever and meat prices, and um, also potential production dip disruption and logistical bottlenecks or shortages and temporary shortages in supply, which could affect uh, domestic food prices. Third question is. Uh, um, the third question is How will the crash in oil prices affect inflation outlook? Do volatile oil prices make it harder for policymakers to calibrate forecasts and plan monetary policy moves? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the global crude oil price is one of the major uh, indicators that uh, we are looking at uh, in terms of uh, assessing the inflation outlook. And uh, we see that the trend in crude oil prices have been uh, showing sharp contraction uh, or sharp decline as a result uh, of both uh, contraction in demand as well as excess global supply. Um, you see, I have to note that so, uh, supply shocks tend to pose considerable challenges to forecasting in terms of quantifying potential second round if, uh, effects. Uh, in particular, oil price cut stems from a fall in global demand as well. Um, nonetheless, the BSP continues to see average inflation settling within the government's inflation target over the policy horizon, with the latest inflation outlook uh, already factoring in the recent significant decline in uh, global oil prices. 
consistent with the BSP's inflation targeting uh, framework, um, we consider temporary shocks or disturbances in certain areas of the economy, often attributed to factors outside the direct control of economic policy, such as oil price shocks, uh, may cause fluctuations in CPI inflation that may not necessarily require a monetary uh, response. In addition, the futures uh, prices of oil continue to be in contango, which means that oil prices are expected to rise from their current levels over the policy horizon. So that's the response for question number three. Um, question number four is, uh, is deflation possible now because of consumers' constrained spending? Uh, so the uh, short answer is that, the, as, as you've heard, the, our latest forecasts continue to show, show inflation um, uh, averaging it close to the lower part or lower end of the range target, so a little above 2% for this year and next year. Um, and at the same time, um, uh, well, the well, overall, our, our view on uh, the, the path or outlook for domestic economic activity or for GDP growth is that it will be a, a, a U-shaped recovery so meaning it will be a slow rebound after uh, containment measures or quarantine measures have been, are, are lifted. And, so, and of course, this, um, this outlook consider, uh, also carries considerable downside risks uh, associated with it. But at the same time, uh, authorities have taken uh, very aggressive um, uh, policy responses in order to safeguard or, or, or protect uh, the the economy against downside risk to growth and private um, and private spending and 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 so these include uh, some some of the measures that have been implemented by the BSP so far to improve or in, in introduce more liquidity in, in into the financial system and also ease some of the regulatory uh, requirements that that would uh, help. Um, uh, ease the flow of lending by the banking system to, to, to households and businesses. And, and for its part, the BSP remains um, ready also to, to util make use of the full range of instruments within its uh, toolkit. Uh, and just, just to um, clarify, to date, the, the BSP has undertaken the following measures. We've reduced our policy interest rate by a total of 125 basis points. And this is expected to help ease domestic financial conditions and also support uh, the growth of the economy uh, over the next few months and, and also prop up uh, business and, and consumer confidence. We've reduced the reserve requirement ratio by 200, um, 200 basis points and that will help uh, add more liquidity to, to the uh, financial system. And on top of those, we've imp implemented um, extraordinary liquidity measures in order to shore up market confidence and also ensure the proper function of, uh, of key markets like the government securities market. Uh, on the last question on uh, outlook on inflation, how will an extended or modified ECQ uh, affect inflation? Um, well, the latest baseline forecast assumed that the enhanced community quarantine will be lifted on April 30, but uh, we have heard the president announce uh, an extension of uh, the general community quarantine to May 15. Um, so the continuation of the uh, quarantine would have an impact in terms of uh, uh, how production activities will be conducted. We view that the resumption of production activities is expected to be gradual due to disruption in the supply chain and constraints in labor capacity due in turn to social distancing. Any further extension on the ECQ or GCQ is expected to further dampen domestic economic activity and reduce consumer demand. However, supply chain disruptions on major commodity items due to the lockdown can cause upward price uh, pressures, especially on food. Now we move to the second set of questions uh, regarding liquidity and credit condition. Uh, Director Lapid. 
Thank you, AG. So the next question is, um, what is the impact of current liquidity and credit growth on the inflation path? So, the, so um, in, our, um, in our forecasting models, the, uh, we, the uh, higher liquidity and credit growth are a positive influence on, on inflation. But I think the key consideration uh, in, in this situation is that the, the possibility of weaker domestic demand could uh, have an impact on, on, li on liquidity and also uh, lending activity by the banking system, which is why uh, we've, we've taken measures to ensure that there will be enough liquidity in the system and that will help um, the, the encourage the banks to lend to their, to their clients. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, if we look at the, the recent data that we put out, the We've released preliminary data on bank lending for February 2020, which shows an increase in uh, overall commercial bank, um, overall banking system lending by 12.2% uh, uh, in February. That's uh, higher than 11.6% uh, in January. So there's been, a, uh, it's at, at least based on the J February data, been, uh, a pickup in lending activity. And this this is underpinned by loans to <clears throat> uh, bank loans to key sectors like um, uh, uh, real estate, uh, fi finance and insurance activities, uh, the utilities sector, and also uh, information and communication as well as construction. Uh, the the of course uh, the liquidity measures that we've implemented uh, also take. Uh, some time to fully work their way through the economy. So we, we expect that over the next few months there will be an improvement in uh, both liquidity conditions and, and crucially also uh, lending by the banks to, to the public. Um, we'd like to report that in the, over the last few weeks in, as a result of some of the liquidity provision measures implemented by the BSP, we've seen uh, some improvement in uh, overall market liquidity. Uh, for example, in the government securities market or in the bond market, um, uh, interest rates or bond yields have um, declined by, by as much as 130 basis points be between March 23 and April 17. So that's in response to some of our policy rate easing, our re release of liquidity and reserve requirement, as well as the uh, some of our uh, direct participation in the, in the government securities market in order to ensure uh, that there's enough liquidity to support, um, to support um, market uh, transactions. And the daily volume of <coughs> uh, government securities transactions has also increased recently. And we've started, um, recently we've also started offering our own term deposit facility. As a, as a way to get more information on market attitudes. And we, we're, we'd like to report the most recent auction this week, we received four times the offered amount in terms of bids. So, there's, so markets are slowly uh, regaining their appetite for, for government security, you know, uh, government securities and also um, the facilities of the BSP. So which tells us that there is not only improved uh, uh, liquidity in the system, but also uh, market sentiment is, is, uh, has been improving as well. Uh, the, the, uh, the next question uh, is about um, monetary policy or, or forward guidance for monetary policy. So uh, the question is how effective was previous monetary policy easing in stoking <laughs> In stoking economic activity and upward uh, inf inflationary pressure on the demand side. Um, so as we said, uh, monetary policy adjustments tend to work with the lag and the impact of some of our recent policy actions are, are expected to occur largely over the next year or so. And we've our current forecast suggests that growth or GDP growth will likely bounce back uh, strongly by next year. And then this is consistent with the slightly higher, but still within target uh, inflation forecast for for 2021. So I think some uh, people will recall that uh, back in 2009, during the global economic slowdown and the global financial crisis, uh, 
the BSP um, implemented a series of policy rate uh, reductions uh, between the period Decem December 2008 until July 2009. And so we reduced our policy interest rate by a total of 200 basis points. And then we've also implemented uh, liquidity enhancing measures to provide a boost to domestic spending and also support investment. And that helped to stabilize and also um, and safeguard the growth trajectory of the economy and support uh, market uh, confidence during that particular crisis. Uh, the, at the same time, this particular uh, episode is, is uh, a little different in the sense that it's essentially a shock to public health. And therefore, the policy response this time uh, is, uh, will tend to be multi-pronged or will require different components. And so apart from monetary policy, an important pillar also will be uh, the fiscal component. And so, which will in, which will provide not only uh, essential public health services, but also um, other uh, other public essential basic services to the population, as well as uh, income support or social am amelioration and social protection, and relief to both wage earners and and um, and businesses. The last ex uh, uh, question. Uh, or, or pre present question from the from media colleagues is if further action is needed in terms of easing monetary policy, has the BSP run out of options? Is there still room for more easing? And which options would should would be best suited to to improve or stoke demand? Um, I think the governor has has uh, previously said that the BSP has ample policy room. Um, in the current uh, environment to provide more stimulus if necessary to the economy. And largely this is because we have a very benign or sub subdued inflation um, uh, forecast or in inflation outlook. And, that, and based on the data that we have, inflation expectations are uh, still continue to be well anchored to the 2 to 4% government target. And at the same time, we're, we're, we, uh, the BSP has, in, has um, clearly indicated our willingness to uh, make use of uh, the full range of uh, instruments within our toolkit in order to provide the necessary uh, liquidity and support for liquidity support for financial markets and for uh, economic activity. Um, but it, at the same time, it will be important for, for us, for policymakers, to continue to look at the, 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 the data and, and see whether recent measures are, uh, some of the recent measures that we've implemented are taking, uh, taking hold or, or having their effect on, on liquidity and economic activity. And so going forward, we'll, tr we'll try to also look at uh, some of the uh, the, the causes behind uh, specific problems, like for example, uh, constraints in specific markets, like the, the bond markets, um, or let's say in the loan market. So, and that will help, uh, help us tailor the policy response. But in terms of uh, the, the overall policy space or uh, the, uh, the, the, the BSP still has a lot of options. So we have uh, various instruments in our toolkit, not uh, apart from the policy interest rate the, and also the reserve requirements. Um, we also received a phone in question. Uh, it's on remittances and the question is, Gob Ben earlier mentioned OFW remittances declining this year. Uh, do you have an estimate how much remittances would decline this year? Well, we did um, some assessment of uh, remittances and um, the baseline assumption is that um, remittances will grow 3% for 2020. But uh, considering that there are already OFWs being repatriated back, particularly from uh, the sea-based sector, we see that there will be some contraction in remittances by about 0.2 to 0.8 uh, percentage point. Um, uh, we believe that remittances could also be affected uh, by uh, emerg uh, the emerging scenario uh, resolution to pandemic problem to the extent that uh, 
the pandemic problem continues, then there might be some more contraction in OFW remittances. AG just to add that the, uh, some of the uncertainty, I think, to the outlook uh, is linked to the fact that we don't know or we're, we're not sure how quickly uh, global trade activity uh, will, will uh, rebound uh, over the next year or so in response to the, the, the measures implemented by various uh, central banks and, and fiscal authorities. And we're we're so we, that's that um, puts a lot of uncertainty in in the global outlook. 